Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is the health and environmental justice impacts from peaker power plants in Boston, Philadelphia, and Detroit. This webinar is being presented by Clean Energy Group, and we're very excited to have panelists with us today from Stratagen. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of the attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You can join the audio via telephone or via your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to expand your webinar console, you can do that by clicking on the orange arrow that you see circled there. Um, that arrow also can minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen. One thing that you might like to do with your webinar console when you expand it is to submit your questions and your comments in the questions box that you see circled here. We will be saving about 15 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Do type your questions in. We'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording within about 48 hours, most likely this afternoon or tomorrow. And we'll also be posting all of those materials on CEG's website at cleanegroup.org slash webinars. That's a good URL to know because it's also where we post all of our upcoming webinars and all previous webinar materials. So with that, I'd like to now pass it over to my colleague, Seth Mullendore. Seth is the president and executive director of Clean Energy Group, and he will be moderating our webinar today. Seth, over to you. Thank you so much, Sam, and thank you to everyone joining us today, and, and a big thank you to, uh, to all of our presenters today. So uh, as Sam mentioned, this webinar is being brought to you by Clean Energy Group. Uh, Clean Energy Group works uh, across the country at the forefront of clean energy innovation to accelerate an equitable and inclusive transition to a resilient, sustainable, clean energy future. Um, we work a lot with communities across the country to advance energy justice uh, across multiple levels. Um, the report that we're gonna be talking about today and our presenters are gonna be telling you more about, about the Peaker problem is brought to you by one of our big initiatives called the, the Phase Out Peakers Initiative that we've been running for several years now. That's a collaborative effort working with uh, on the ground groups, environmental justice groups and community-based organizations that are uh, opposing existing and, and proposed new Peaker power plants that are impacting the, the health and, and well-being of their communities and advocating for clean energy alternatives, uh, renewables, battery storage, uh, sometimes transmission efficiency and demand response alternatives to provide uh, a cleaner peak power. So you can learn a lot more about uh, the, the Phase Out Peakers initiative and our other initiatives on our website at cleanegroup.org. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have four folks that will be presenting. Uh, first up is going to be Shelly Robbins. She's a project director with Clean Energy Group. And most of Shelly's work is focused on the Phase Out Peakers Initiative. She was the primary author for the, the report, the, the Peaker Problem. So we're going to start with, with Shelly. Then we're going to have a couple of uh, longtime collaborators of, of Clean Energy Group from Stratagen. Uh, first up will be Aaron Childs. And Aaron is a director at Stratagen, which is a mission-driven consulting company focused on enabling a clean and just energy transition. Aaron focuses on enabling uh, scale development and deployment of clean energy technologies, including distributed energy resources, energy storage, and green hydrogen. Um, her work includes the development of policy analysis and business, business strategies that enable a transition away from fossil fuels and towards uh, sustainable clean energy solutions. Uh, then we'll have Eliasid Animas, who is a consultant with strategy, uh, working on strategy's decarbonization uh, strategy practice area, where he helps utilities, technology companies, governments, and, and non-government organizations to trace and achieve their clean energy and decarbonization goals. His expertise includes analysis and planning of energy resources, cost benefit and storage dispatch analyses, Valuation of long duration storage, uh, distribution, distributed energy and peak energy technologies, and working on Western markets and structured, structured energy markets. Uh, and then we're going to finish with, with Marielle Mango. Mar Maria is also a project director with Clean Energy Group. Uh, her fo focus is mainly with our resilient power project that uh, needs to enable the, the access and benefits of solar and energy storage for, for communities. 
Amari really led a lot of the, the community-based partnerships and collaboration on this report, and she's gonna be talking about that aspect of the work. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Shelly, and we'll be taking your questions uh, throughout. So please, as you, you think of them, uh, put them in, in the question box, and we'll get to those at the end. Great, thank you, Seth. I hope everybody can hear me properly. Um, make sure I can get control of things. Super. All right. Um, I guess a, a, a big question is why? Um, why are we doing this report? So I'm going to go over why. Uh, why this report? Some of the health findings, and then some of the city highlights from um, Boston, Philadelphia and Detroit. Um, this report arose from success actually in New York City. Um, the details of that success are outlined in Appendix A. Um, this is a big report. <laughs> there are a lot of different parts to it. Um, but Appendix A tells the story of our, our work with the PEAK Coalition. But in short, CEG was part of a coalition that formed in 2020 called the PEAK Coalition. And the, the goal of that coalition was to end peak or plant pollution in vulnerable communities in New York City. And it was the first comprehensive effort in the US to reduce the negative and racially disproportionate health impacts of the Peaker fleet and replace them with non-combustion alternatives. The Peak Coalition is comprised of New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, UPROSE, the Point CDC, and Clean Energy Group. And so if it weren't for that work, um, we probably wouldn't be here uh, doing this today. So why, let's see, advance that. Um, it's not advancing. Okay, there we go. All right, so why this report? Um, well, peaker power plants, just to back up just a little bit, they're a special kind of plant that only fire up when the load on the grid is higher than what baseload plants can manage. Um, baseload plants are the ones that run almost constantly 24 seven, and they generally have pollution controls um, and are tend to be more efficient than peaker plants. Um, by contrast, peakers ramp up and down, turn on and off really quickly, and they have a narrow peak. And older plants often do not have any form of emission controls and they can't be retrofit. Um, so they're dirty. Um, because they are um, they tend to be located uh, in urban areas because they're closer to load and we'll see a map later on that shows that. And then another reason why this report was because of that work with the Peak Coalition. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the reports that were produced by the Peak Coalition. But that work proved that data-driven, community-led efforts can be successful. So looking at, let's see if I can advance the slide. All right. So to the first point that peakers have a disproportionate impact on low-income communities and communities of color, these next two tables make that abundantly clear. On the left is the low-income percentile. Um, so the deeper the purple, the more low-income citizens live within the three-mile radius of a peaker plant, and this is at the national level. And on the far right is the average NOx emission rate of peakers impacting that percentile. This data is from the peaker plant mapping tool on CEG's website, and I put that web address here on the slide, and I recommend uh, looking at that mapping tool um, at the website shown here. Uh, the, the tables show data distribution um, and the maps show the geographic distribution element. But if you look at those last two lines, um, those NOx emissions um, for those last two groups of percentiles, you can see they are much higher um, than for the first uh, percentile, which is your higher income population. All right, and this one looks very similar, um, but different data. Um, this one is for people of color percentiles. Um, so on the left, uh, persons of color percentile on the left, and then NOx emissions on, a, on the right. And I'd really like to call your attention to the stark difference 
between the first and the last Knox rate boxes. Um, so the basically the the wider the community, the lower the average NOx emission rate, and then the more persons of color, it jumps pretty dramatically for that last group of folks. So the data, the data is very clear on this. Okay, so I'm still not advancing. All right. Now, to that third point, point about why we initiated this report, a little bit more information um, about the peak coalition. In um, well, first, the peaker plants. Um, it was found the peaker plants in New York City were contributing 94% of the state's NOx emissions on high ozone days, while pro uh, providing as little as 36% of the gross energy load. So in May of 2020, the Peak Coalition released a report called Dirty Energy, Big Money detailing the real social and economic costs of the New York City peaker fleet, and that was followed in 2021 with the fossil fuel end game, which details a strategic and policy roadmap to retire and replace all of New York City's fossil peaker fleet by 2030 using a community-led uh, process and strategy. These reports are just one aspect of the Peak Coalition's work, and those community-led and research-based efforts combined with New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, called the CLCPA for short, with those provisions resulted in some extremely impactful announcements and rulings starting last fall that have the potential to remove uh, right now nine of the city's 18 peakers, which amounts to more than a third of the city's po uh, fossil peaker emissions between now and 2030. So this report is building upon the previous work as part of peak in New York City. All right, now, before we talk about the health impacts of peaker combustion emissions, let's first take a very close look um, at small particulate matter called PM 2.5. Uh, PM 2.5 is emitted both directly from combustion processes and it is formed in a secondary way when other combustion emissions such as NOx and SO2 clump together. Um, so let's consider the size of PM 2.5 up there in the top left, the size of a human hair. Um, so PM 2.5 is obviously 2.5 micrometers in diameter. A human hair is 50 to 70. The alveoli in our lungs are 200. Um, so therein lies the problem. Um, that, that, that is why combustion emissions are so harmful to the human body. Because it's so easy for them to get into those tiny air sacs and travel. Now, uh, on the left, um, we have an illustration uh, that shows how NOx and PM 2.5 negatively impact so many different systems in the body. And this graphic is, of course, in the report. You can take a much closer look at it there. Um, but, but to cut to the chase, peaker emissions damage the human body and they cut lives short. The American Lung Association looked at uh, the value of those lives lost as premature deaths and the economic impact of avoiding these health impacts and deaths in their new report called Zeroing In on Healthy Air. Um, and some of those statistics are included in our report and they're here on the right. Um, that report focused on the health impacts of eliminating the combustion emissions from both transportation and power generation. Um, and it provided a great complement to this report. And I'll note here the, that our report has a list of resources in the back that includes the American Lung Association report, as well as similar research confirming these findings by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, if you want to dig deeper into that. Now, here is that national map um, that I've been talking about. Um, you can see very clearly um, that peaker plants, and these are all peaker plants, and this map was prepared by Stratagen, um, that peaker plants do cluster in uh, the, the urban areas. Um, and we're going to take a look, though, particularly at Boston, Philadelphia, and Detroit. We chose these cities 
because um, number one, because of the the uh, the concentration of peakers in those cities um, in relationship to uh, low income communities and communities of color. But we also looked at them. We're not going to go into great detail in this report, but we also looked at them because they are each in a, a different ISO or uh, you know a transmission organization. Um, so we're not going to talk too much about that today. So first, we'll look at Boston. So the map on the left, of course, um, we looked, uh, Stratagen uh, analyzed all of, you know, they looked at the entire Peaker fleet for the whole Boston metro area. So that's what you see on the left. Uh, but then we drilled down to look at the ones that really, what we call, we call them high impact peakers. Um, those are the ones, as I said before, that have, they are all closer to um, um, environmental justice communities, low income communities and communities of color that have historically borne the brunt uh, of these emissions over time. Um, and all of the ones on the left, um, in case you're wondering what all those little circles are without names, those are all in Appendix C in the back of the report, and that's the case for each city. Um, uh, but the, but we're, we we kind of um, look specifically at these particular ones. Um, some of them are, are are much closer into the Boston area. Some of them are out just a little bit, but they all are close to communities that are traditionally more heavily impacted by um, fossil fuels and other harmful infrastructure. And I'm gonna. Um, call up with each city I'm going to call up um, a particular plant and take a look at it uh, in this case um, in Boston where this is the M Street Jets um, this peaker is quite literally to Pratt and Whitney jet engines um, they and those are those green stacks right there and you can see they're very close to ball fields and the neighborhood um, they're right there. And those um, those jet engines back up the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority system. Um, they, they, they don't have a very, um, they don't run very often, but when they do, they're pretty dirty. That Because they don't run very often, you know, that's one of the factors that we look at um, that would make them a, a pretty good candidate for replacement with non-combustion alternatives. Um, we outline all those non-combustion alternatives in, in the back, um, in uh, Appendix B of the report. Um, all the, just, just for folks who aren't familiar with those terms in general, we outline that in Appendix B. So that's just kind of one, uh, one particular peaker uh, in Boston that, you know, when you, when you look on the ground, it's like, wow, <laughs> I can't believe it's sitting right there next to ball fields. All right, so next, We'll take a quick peek at Philadelphia. Philadelphia is impacted by its neighboring states, New Jersey and Delaware. Um, when we zoomed in um, on the right, we looked just specifically at the Philadelphia um, peakers because I mean, that city is is our focus. So we didn't, you know, we didn't zoom in on the ones in the other states. Uh, however, again, they are listed in Appendix C. So we've got several um, uh, plants in just in the Philadelphia area that have a pretty high impact. And I want to, all right, this one, Schuylkill, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, it's kind of a tough word, but that peaker plant, you know, but, Philadelphia is known for its, its row houses, um, row house neighborhoods, and that is uh, Schuylkill Combustion Turbine sitting right there in, in that neighborhood. That one is owned, it's a 52-year-old plant owned by Exelon Corporation, and it bookends the South Philadelphia neighborhood, also known as South Philly, uh, along with the Southwark plant. Its NOx emissions are pretty darn high, 14.93 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, the Southwark plant is also owned by Exelon, and I'm gonna show you what I mean by bookending. All right, so here is kind of a Google Earth view of South Philadelphia, and you've got the Southwark plant down on the right, Schuylkill up on the left, and there are only 3.3 miles 
between those plants and that incredibly vibrant uh, grid, urban grid in the middle. So those folks who live there, they're, they're bookended by peaker plants. Um, and I would say that both plants are very, very old and they both have high NOx emission rates and low capacity factors. So looking at these factors alone, they would make good candidates for replacement with non-combustion alternatives. And it would also be an excellent thing for those communities. All right, and now here is Detroit. Um, again, Detroit on the left, all the Detroit Metro Peakers that we considered, they're back in Appendix C, and then the Detroit High Impact Peakers um, are there on the right. And this one, this is Dearborn Industrial. Um, every time I show this photograph, it elicits a few gasps. Um, this is the Dearborn Industrial Generation uh, gas turbine, nicknamed DIG. The neighboring community actually has successfully fought the addition of a, uh, additional capacity to this site, thank goodness. But unfortunately, this facility is still here, planted right next to an elementary school and a playground that is Selena Elementary on the right and the playground and there are the stacks. Um, this one is owned by Hydra Co Enterprises and it is a subsidiary of CMS Energy Corporation. So yeah, these are these are the kinds of things that you know that we were looking for when we were looking for for those high impact peakers. Um, a lot of a lot happened um, right after we uh, published this report, and I imagine we'll get questions. Um, I believe the Inflation Reduction Act is actually being signed into law today, um, and it actually has major positive uh, ramifications for this work in, in the peaker space. Um, first off, it has tax credits for battery storage for those uh, entities that have a tax liability. It also has direct pay options for tax exempt entities such as states and political subdivisions. Um, and there are quite a few uh, peaker plants that are owned by, you know, I would, MBTA, for example, is a um, probably one of those entities that could take uh, advantage of the direct pay option since it probably doesn't have a tax liability. And it also allows for the transfer of tax credits to another taxpayer. Um, and they make that a lot easier. So that's all well and good, but how, how are the, you know, if, if uh, uh, entities do decide to start replacing their peaker plants with battery storage, you know, using these generous tax credits and direct pay options. The question becomes, how do they do it in a way that most directly benefits uh, environmental justice? And that's where this report can come into play. First, it identifies the peakers located closest to low-income communities and communities of color in Boston, Philadelphia, and Detroit, those particular cities. But beyond that, um, for communities um, elsewhere in the country, the report provides tools, data sources, and strategies for identifying peakers impacting those uh, communities in those locations. So it's, it's sort of a roadmap. Um, if, if I were going to utilize the Inflation Reduction Act to target the closure of a peaker, how do I choose which peakers um, will have the greatest environmental justice uh, benefit. And so just because there's a tax credit does not mean that EJ is baked into it. Um, there has to be a little bit more work put into it than that. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Stratagen um, to talk a little bit more about some of the great technical stuff. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Childs and I'm a director at Stratagen Consulting. Our team at Stratagen has been privileged to support Clean Energy Group in 
um, developing robust data and analytics to assess the community impacts of peakers and also to support the collaboration with community groups to help build approaches to you know, retire those fossil fuel power plants. Um, Stratagen is a mission-driven consulting company and focused on enabling a clean and just energy transition. And our team works on enabling the scaled deployment of clean energy technologies to help, help enable a transition away from fossil fuels. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of background and context on our analytical approach before turning it over to my colleague, Elia Seed, to speak to some of the specific findings that we developed for this report. So first, I, I want to orient everyone on what we mean when we oftentimes talk about cost effectiveness. Um, generally speaking, if, when you hear folks talk about cost effectiveness, they're really talking about financial or, or energy market cost effectiveness. And they're thinking about the installed costs of a resource um, and the energy market revenue streams that that resource can produce. But when we're talking about community impacts, what Shelley is, we really need to start including some of these non-market benefits, which include things like the health and mortality benefits that Shelley outlined, as well as things like climate change mitigation, um, resilience in the face of extreme weather, and job creation. Um, so what you're seeing right now is a little bit of a snapshot of um, some of the non-market benefits that we helped to identify through our work with the Peak Coalition in New York City. Um, and so, you know, I know our, our discussion today is focused on other regions, but hopefully this should give folks a sense of the scale and the magnitude of these impacts and the way that they can factor in to cost effectiveness. Again, you were seeing some very large numbers from Shelley as we were talking about health and mortality um, impact. So it's really important to keep in mind these components um, as we're starting to have these conversations about transitioning away from peakers um, and, and what that looks like for impacted communities. So um, the next thing I, I just want to make sure that everyone understands um, is just a little bit of the context on um, replacement of peakers with clean energy solutions, namely energy storage. Um, and it, I think it's really helpful uh, to make sure folks understand that, that this is a very feasible, technically feasible transition. Um, energy storage has all of the performance characteristics that are required to replace the grid services currently provided by peakers. Um, so specifically, energy storage has some really fast ramping capabilities. Um, in fact, faster than peaking power plants. And so they have the ability to ramp up and down much more quickly, integrate renewables much more seamlessly, and so are, are considered to be a very integral part of the clean energy transition on that front. Um, the other important characteristic about energy storage is that it has a relatively small physical footprint. So many times peakers will be um, cited, as Shelley showed, right next to um, you know, other community resources like schools. And this is because they have a very small physical footprint. They can fit onto a very small parcel of land, unlike, for example, wind or, or solar resources. Storage, on the other hand, has that very small physical footprint, much like peaker power plants. And so they are really, really um, perfect for deployment in urban areas, and they can help to address um, you know, local reliability constraints without producing any additional emissions. Um, and the last thing that storage does really well that has helped it to step into this space um, historically filled by, by peakers is the ability to provide some really fast grid services, voltage response, local reliability services that just help to keep the grid running really smoothly and keep the lights on no matter what happens. So this is really important context for folks. Just remember, you know, these transitions are super duper feasible and they're, they're happening right now, right? So um, we have seen the deployment of energy storage to replace both aging fossil assets as well as newly planned fossil fueled power plants. We're seeing this across California and New York right now, heavily driven by some of the clean energy policies, including CLCPA, which um, Shelley mentioned, but um, we're really excited to see this work with Clean Energy Group start to advance some of these lessons learned and best practices um, to support the work of communities across the country. Um, and so with that, a uh, perfect intro to turn things over to my colleague, Eliasid Anamas, to talk a little bit about some of the work that he developed. Oops.
Oh, thanks, Erin, and hi, everyone. I want to start saying that these kind of successful cases and, you know, our own decarbonization engagements have convinced me that there are some economic, environmental, and equity reasons to target pickers and that their replacement is feasible and cost-effective from, from a planning perspective. Uh, I think that it was the same thinking that inspired the Clean Energy Group to get us involved in this project and to take a step back from our localized work to get a national view of the picker problem. Um, so together with the Clean Energy Group, we used a top-down approach to leverage public data and quantify the impacts of pickers across the country. So this exercise allowed us to identify hotspots of picker externalities, but also opportunities and priority areas uh, for the replacement. As you can see from this slide, uh, we identified a rather large picker fleet based on the power plant operations. This is almost, I think, one third of the fossil fuel generation capacity in the States. Uh, so, you know, while the picker fleet by definition is not used very often, it tends to be located close to urban areas. So when it goes wrong, it disproportionately affects uh, the health of millions, in many cases, people living in disadvantaged communities. Um, after this initial screening, we looked at the replacement opportunities and considered a more localized um, set of factors. Uh, but Shelly already told you about those local use cases, so I'll walk you through the more general and more technical methodology of the study. Um, so first, we started by defining peakers. We considered a peaker plant, any gas or oil plant that, you know, because of its technology, was able to provide power during peak times and that was utilized less than 15% of the time during the last three years. Um, this threshold, I want to add, is a result of our empirical work in the topic, and I think it encompasses the majority of the speakers in the country, but um, some have, might, might have uh, been um, lost in this you know, high-level analysis, but that's why we did a, a local-level analysis afterwards. Uh, but then we jumped um, into the data and for this work, it was very important for us to use only publicly available data that other folks can easily pull to create their own analysis and look at their own communities. So for this, we relied on EPAs, uh, tools and reports. Uh, for those joining from overseas, the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. And we looked at sites like the eGrid, uh, that records operational data from power plants, um, the air markets program with detailed historical data on emissions, the power plants and neighboring communities mapping tool that combines many data sets and allows for geographical visualization of them, as well as demographic data from the US Census and the environmental justice screen also created by the EPA. Um, having this data map down, we were able to identify places of interest where we then looked at market rules, local policy, energy prices, neighboring communities, and even more detailed generation data to assess the opportunities and urgency to replace some of these urban benefits. I'll be really happy to answer, you know, like more detailed questions. You can add them in the chat. Um, but with this you know, high level view, eventually I'll pass things over to Muriel. Um, Mari, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that slight technical difficulty. Um, Mario Mango, I'm a project director with Clean Energy Group, and I will be discussing uh, the community input that we had throughout this report to um, learn more about what's going on on the ground in terms of peak opposition, but also what's going on the ground in terms of um, efforts to build resilience other ways through policy, program development, community action, things like that. You know, I want to highlight that, um, well, I'll be going through the folks that really help contribute to the report. This is really just a snapshot, and I really encourage everyone um, who's interested in their individual actions or the, the folks that actually are doing this work on the ground to reach out to them through our, um, all the contact information in the groups can be found in the report. So I am going to start in Boston. We featured Green Ridge Chelsea, Breathe Clean North Shore, Slingshot, and Massachusetts Climate Action Network. Um, 
all four organizations are, are featured in the report and the work that they're doing. I like to pull out a quote by Susan Smoller, who is one of the founding mother, uh, members of Breathe Clean North Shore, who's working on peaker acquisition efforts in Peabody, Massachusetts. And she said, I've been going door to door and pointing to the smokestack next to where the current peakers are. Until this winter, when the site was clear cut, the generators were hidden from view. People seemed oblivious to what's there, what they're building, and how it will impact them. A lot of the folks that we talked to in Boston, Detroit, and Philadelphia that are working on the ground emphasize the same thing, that their neighbors and their community members understand the health impacts of the poor air quality because they feel them every day in their household, but they're not sure where they're coming from or how to uh, fight them. And peak opposition efforts have really worked uh, to, to build, bring that up to, to speed. So a little bit about uh, the, the organizations that we feature for Boston. Green Roots Chelsea is a nonprofit community-based organization working to improve the urban environment and public health in Chelsea, an environmental justice community in Massachusetts. In 2007, Green Roots was successful in stopping um, the development of a 250 megawatt diesel powered peaker power plant in their community. This was part of a larger coalition effort um, that spanned many years, a lot of active on the ground efforts, including petitions, um, protests, uh, the, the, a spread of issues really, and they were successful in stopping that plant. Uh, they really focused their efforts again on the health impacts. And we've seen that um, across the organizations that we spoke with that the folks really don't understand where, why their air quality is poor and how it's impacting their health. And they wanted to be able to, to know how they can have a direct um, action and improving that through pollution and emissions mitigation. So uh, Chelsea has the fourth highest asthma rate in Massachusetts, and much of that can be um, due to the fact of the high pollution rates in the area. We also spoke to Breathe Clean North Shore. They are working on a current opposition effort for the Peabody, Peabody Peaker Plant, which is a gas and oil-fired peaker power plant that is being developed right next to two existing peakers that are located, pardon me, that are located in an EJ community within Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, Susan Smoller, who I quoted in the previous slide, is one of the members of Breathe Clean North Shore. In 2022, so this year, CEG and Stratagen found that energy storage is not only a viable replacement option for the needed capacity for the Peabody plant, but is also preferable from an environmental perspective and re results in significant benefits for consumers, including cost savings and environmental justice issues. So for this particular um, peaker plant, CEG and Stratagen were able to support the efforts of on the ground folks to determine what would solar and storage look like in its place. And these efforts are ongoing with Green Cleath North Shore and their partners, which include the Massachusetts Community Action Network, as well as Slingshot and their Fix the Grid campaign. Both of these organizations are supporting um, organizations like Breathe Clean North Shore on their on the ground efforts to oppose the Peaker Power Plant. Oftentimes it's through statewide forums, articles, ad additional resources being built. Slingshot is actually helping Breathe Clean North Shore develop a campaign strategy that includes um, tactics, how they can reach out to more allies, how they can uh, really get their position heard to folks outside of the community. And Slingshot also leads the Fix the Grid campaign, which has broader efforts to overhaul the regional energy grid uh, throughout Massachusetts and really incorporate resilience, energy storage, clean energy, renewable energy in, um, as an alternative to continued investments in fossil fuel infrastructure. In Philadelphia, we were able to speak with the Clean Air Council. Um, the Clean Air Council is a works at the municipal statewide and federal level to protect residents from the harmful impacts of air pollution and their advocacy director matt walker stated we must rapidly transition away from using fossil fuels for generation generating power and onto renewable energy supported by things like battery storage energy efficiency and smart programs that balance energy supply and demand the Clean Air Council um, works again, similar to, to MCAN and Slingshot's efforts in Massachusetts to really support community-based organizations on the ground. CAC provides um, advocacy support as well as law. They have lawyers on, on staff that are able to provide that support. And they're currently working to uh, oppose Invergy's proposal to build a peaker power plant, a 639 megawatt gas fire power plant in Elizabeth Township in Southwest PA. 
And they are also supporting community efforts in Renovo, which is an environmental justice community in central PA. Um, and there's a picker plant being proposed there as well. That's over a thousand megawatts. Um, a lot of, again, the, the, the line between all of these groups is the connection of health demanding health risk assessments and demanding um, that there's cumulative reports like in this case in Philadelphia that really shows the risk of pollution from these facilities on air quality and public health over time and um, these resources are really helping folks be able to understand how are they being how is their health being affected finally in Detroit we spoke to Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition Solidarity and Highland Park Crisis Coalition through Solidarity um, Bridget Vale, who's the energy democracy organizer with the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, stated, we need state policies that slash toxic emissions by accelerating plant closures in EJ communities, prohibiting the construction of new gas-fired power plants and supporting community-owned renewables. For um, the Mi Michigan, pardon me, Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, uh, it's a statewide coalition that works to achieve a clean, healthy, and safe environment for environmental justice communities. And Solidarity is a nonprofit organization that serves the Highland Park community, an environmental just community in the center of Detroit, in their efforts to transition to a just and equitable energy system for all. Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition works again a lot on the cumulative impacts of emissions on environmental justice communities with an emphasis on health. Um, they're currently working on the campaign and helped to launch the campaign Work For Me DTE, which is the utility. Um, and they're really working with a lot of EJ groups locally that are mobilizing community efforts in opposition to DTE's 15-year integrated resource plan, which does not emphasize, in their opinion, enough resilience or um, renewable energy or EJ issues. And they're really trying to replace it with a vision of a healthy, affordable, and community-based energy system. Solidarity similarly builds community awareness about energy-related health concerns. They've worked a lot on um, extreme heat and the, the heat effect in EJ communities. They uh, work uh, usually as part of a broader coalition on um, issues related to clean energy, uh, EJ issues in their community, and um, ways to reduce and, uh, pollution and improve health. They're also a member of the Highland Park Crisis Coalition, who also works in Highland Park to uplift and empower Highland Park residents through social, economic, and ecological justice. Finally, um, we included here a lessons learned in regards to New Orleans. While we didn't feature New Orleans as its own separate um, city in the report, we did want to include it in terms of what the folks there on the ground were doing to implement change. We featured together New Orleans, Feed the Second Line, and Alliance for Affordable Energy, who stated the 2021 and 2022 hurricane seasons put a spotlight on how vital resilient energy solutions are as the leading cause of death for both years um, of power loss, both directly due to extreme heat impacts and from carbon monoxide poisoning when families turn to fossil fuel generators. It is time to follow community leaders who know what they need to stay safe. I've highlighted here where the Pico power plants in New Orleans are located. For the purpose of this lessons learned, we're focusing on the New Orleans power station, which is a 126 uh, megawatt gas plant in New Orleans. There has been, this was proposed in 2016, and there was major community-led opposition against the, the gas plant. CEG and Stratagen actually supported an analysis to show that solar and storage could provide the same services to the grid and would cost significantly less than the gas plant over time with the benefit of no emissions. This gas plant is located within three miles of 22,000 people. 90% um, of them are part of minority groups and 47% live in low-income households. So it's really in the center of multiple EJ communities. And what happened is that the Alliance for Affordable Energy, who's Louisiana's only dedicated watchdog organization working to protect consumer rights at the Louisiana Public Service Commission and New Orleans City Council, as well as other partners, including the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, 350 New Orleans, Valia, and the local Sierra Club chapter, works to oppose this, um, this plant. And unfortunately, the city council approved the plant. They were really sold on Entergy's claim that the Pico would be able to jumpstart the grid in the event of a power outage um, and really leaned on that as a way to improve reliability in the area and decrease the impacts of power outages on vulnerable populations. However, when the first major storm hit after the completion of the New Orleans power station, which was Hurricane Ida, the Pico plant failed to come online. 
There were weeks of power outages. Uh, the same health, health impacts that had been seen previously were seen once again with carbon monoxide poisoning, um, extreme heat issues, uh, inability to access refrigeration for medication or medical devices, uh, outlets for medical devices. And, uh, you know, I, while they weren't successful in um, stopping the development of the New Orleans power station, I do want to highlight that all of these groups have moved on to improve resilience in New Orleans through the development of resilience hubs, through policy and program proposals that improve the economics for resilience, uh, solar and storage systems for medically vulnerable individuals, for nonprofit organizations. Together, New Orleans is um, leading the charge on developing community lighthouses, which are resilience hubs primarily in institutions of faith so that all of um, New Orleans residents can walk within 15 minutes and be at a resilience hub in the event of a power outage. So there's been a lot of growth from this effort, even though the power plant was ultimately built. This is my contact information. I, I really do uh, encourage everyone, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. But um, everyone should reach out to these organizations and learn more about their, their great work. We'll be working to have webinars later on this year uh, featuring many of them. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mariel. Thank you to all our presenters today. We have a lot of questions, so we're going to jump into those now, and I'm going to jump around a bit in these questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and thanks for all the feedback from folks as well, including two different pronunciations for the power plant in Philadelphia. So uh, that debate may, may, may rage on. Um, we had some early questions come in uh, just about uh, peaker plants kind of in general, like what was the lifespan of a peaker plant? And also the, um, the proportion of old dirty peakers versus new peakers on the grid. So uh, Aaron, LEC, I wonder if you guys have any sense of, of those those questions. Yeah, I can I can take a first um, stab at that. So a, a lot of these um, power plants, when they're initially commissioned and planned, will say something like you know like a 30-year lifespan or a 40-year lifespan. But part of the challenge is that we see these plants hanging on for like 50, 60. I think the worst we saw was 70 years. And so by the time these plants get to be that old. Um, they're very run down, they're extremely inefficient, they're antiquated technology, and so they oftentimes are running as peaker power plants because they're so inefficient that they can no longer run um, as a baseload resource or other resource. So, you know, I think a, a big part of what we've been talking about with, with Seth and Shelley and folks is really, you know, these plants are some of the worst offenders. They're extremely fuel inefficient. Their um, carbon emissions are very high because they're fuel inefficient, but also their local and particulate emissions tend to be very high for the same reason. And so these are, I think, what we think of as high priority plants to transition um, to cleaner solutions and, and to get retired. Great. And that, there were some questions about those alternatives as well. You know, this report doesn't go deep on what the alternatives are. It's, it's more highlighting what the problem is and, and where some of the worst actors are and, and the, the health impacts of, of these power plants. Uh, but it doesn't get into as much about the alternatives. Um, we've done a lot of work with Stratagen over, over the years now, and we've done a lot of work on that. Um, I, I will hand it over to uh, Aaron to talk more about that. But um, there are some reports that do look at this, particularly uh, fossil fuel end game in, in New York City. So Aaron, if you want to pick up from there about what these solutions look like and what the alternatives yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, this, the slide I had that sort of said, hey, here's the here's the three things that energy storage can do and, and peakers used to do them and they don't need to anymore um, should give you a sense, hopefully, that energy storage is, is a foundational part of the toolkit when we think about um, grid needs and reliability, but obviously, um, energy storage needs to charge from somewhere. And so an important part of conversation that we've been having is, you know, what are what is it charging off of? Can we see options to um, deploy solar in local communities and, and create community benefit? You know, Marielle was talking about um, resilience, right? And especially as we think about the ability to site resources in communities, you start to see um, ability to access multiple, you know, benefits, including resilience, as well as um, charging storage, displacing peakers. Um, there's a whole ton, there's a whole host of solutions, honestly, you know, even things like energy efficiency help to decrease um, demand on the system and make it less necessary 
to you know run those peaker power plants so um, I don't want to spend I could spend you know a full 10 15 minutes talking about this and I don't want to take up too much time but hopefully that gives folks a sense of sort of what that toolkit looks like um, part of the solution set but of course happy to go into that further if there's additional questions and yeah, if, and, if I may ahead, um, I'll, I'll add um, I was very intentional in using the word non-combustion alternatives in the report because I did not want to silo the the uh, you know the the possibility of uh, what a community can do and so we outline you know we do have a, a kind of a brief um, description of all sorts of things from virtual power plants and demand response um, all the different alternatives um, in appendix b um, but again that my choice of words there was very intentional yeah you guys touched on a, a couple of other things uh, some people did point out that yeah, there are behavioral changes that that can reduce peak as well. This has to do when people are using energy or when when consumers are using energy, whether that's people or businesses. So there's a lot of things that can be done even at the behavioral level uh, to, to reduce and, and impact peakers. Um, and Shelley, you raised that the non-combustion. There was a question about hydrogen, whether that could be a solution as well. This has been something that uh, a number of utilities and, and, and uh, oil and gas companies are very excited about. Um, but when you're talking about combustion hydrogen, you do not reduce the, uh, the, the the NOx emissions. You don't reduce the health impacts on surrounding communities. In fact, hydrogen um, may have higher impacts on, on those communities. So yes, you get rid of, of carbon if you're using green hydrogen. There's a whole host of things we can talk about that as well, but you're not reducing the health impact and you may actually be making it worse. So that should be factored into this. Fuel cells are, are different. That you do just get water, but when you combust hydrogen, you get all sorts of nasty stuff as, as well. Um, and I did want to say we are recording this, and we will be sharing the slides because we got a lot of questions about this. So we'll be sending that all out probably within the next day, so that you all you all have this. And a lot of the images that were presented here are available in the uh, the report as well, which is on our on our website. And and, and our hydrogen web page is the very last resource. Um, if anybody wants to go right to the last page, that goes right to our hydrogen resources page for yes. the information. Um, one thing to uh, a counter to the, uh, the, the battery uh, option is there was a question about sustainability of batteries as well. One, uh, there was a question just, you know, how long will batteries last in, in degradation and, and their, their actual lifespan versus, versus speakers? And then two, the sustainability of, of batteries. You know, there are sourcing issues and there's end of life issues as well so i just kind of throw that out there uh, to anybody that would want to to elaborate on you know the lifespan of batteries and you know their, their impacts versus say a peak of plant fuel I, I would um one thing i like to to have folks think about is okay when when we first started burning coal was anybody thinking about the end of life of coal no they were not same thing with gas um the beauty of where we are at this point in time is that yes, as we are developing the supply chain, we are also at the very same time trying to figure out all of those problems and get ahead of that. So um, that is, um, there, you know, there's a lot of work out there being done with battery recycling, um, uh, moving uh, EV batteries down to stationary batteries when they're no longer able to meet a certain kind of uh, uh, peak performance. There's just, there is so much being done on this issue um, right now. And so I have a lot of hope that folks out there are figuring things out. Um, and Aaron, do you have? Yeah, I guess just that? I can, um, you know, at least answer one piece, which is so um, when we see batteries deployed, they'll often be cited for 10 to 15 years, but developers will also look at extended contracts for for 20 to 25 years and and that just means they'll come in and replace batteries if if they're seeing any of the battery packs degrade or or reduce in performance and i think just echoing shelly's point you know we're seeing um, end of life and battery recycling being a, a really, really important area of focus for um, the energy storage industry. The, the, that industry is is very aware that they are, um, you know, riding a lot of, you know, en enthusiasm about kind of how we create a, a sustainable transition. And and it's been very clear to us that the industry is interested to kind of rise to the challenge that, that folks are flagging here. And so we, we know that's a, that's an area of focus and, and kind of R&D work. I think it's worth mentioning as well um, that with the battery recycling industry coming up and so much innovation happening there that it's 
uh, done equitably, right? That we don't create this entire next generation of recycled EV, uh, re recycled batteries that are only used in LMI communities or only used um, at discounted prices in communities of color, and that it, it's an equitable industry where everyone sees the benefit of, of recycled batteries and um, not just kind of targeted towards specific communities. There's a couple of questions I'll combine together here. One, one was a question about um, why why are peakers even located in, in densely populated areas, which we didn't really cover here as, as much. Um, peakers tend to be located where the, the load is, where people, again, are, are using energy. Um, this, this question also asked about tr transmission, and that is often the problem, that you don't have enough transmission to bring energy from outside of these densely populated areas into them during these peak periods. Usually it's fine, um, but during those, those, those times when it's strained, that's a problem. We're seeing in, in the New York City work that transmission is one of the solutions to get rid of peakers. Um, that's actually been cited in some, some transmission projects is we build these, we don't need these peakers anymore. Um, and that leads to the other question that I saw that came, came up is, do we even need these peaker plants that, that exist out there? Um, I'd like to turn this over to, to Darren and, and Elliot Seed. Um, you know, some people are asking, we've got some very low capacity factor things here. Are these things actually even needed or are they just being kept around because somebody can squeeze a little bit of revenue out of them? Yeah, I mean, the question of do, do we need them really, I think, is, is good. Um, you know, peakers generally, I would say, provide a grid service, right, or a set of grid services, and that's why they've been kept online. Um, the question of do we need to continue to rely on them now that we have solutions like demand response, energy storage, um, you know, for peakers that are running fewer and fewer hours of the year, it becomes so much more feasible to look at these other solutions to replace the, the energy that comes from a peaker, right? Would you, would you rather get a, have a peaker fire up in your backyard or would you rather, you know, run your washing machine later in the day or, you know, modify some some behavior. So I think there's a lot of what we're seeing and what we're seeing in the conversation is that there's a lot of solutions that can reduce our reliance on peakers and make it much more feasible to turn them off. And also, you know, give the, there are folks who have responsibilities to operate the grid and make sure everyone's lights turn on when you turn on the switch. And so making sure that those folks are comfortable that these solutions that we're putting out there allow them to continue to do their job um, while halting the, the pollution that we're seeing coming out of these speakers. So, circling back to demand response, in addition to like behavioral shift, that can also, from an uh, you know from a an energy burden standpoint, um, that can help lower bills if you're using um, if things are designed correctly, if if uh, households are properly incentivized, um, that will lower their bill and therefore lower energy burden. So that's another benefit. You know, I also, some of the communities have brought up multiple times, the organizations that I spoke with, that if these speakers were cited in upper income communities or high income communities, that they would be much quicker to find replacements and other alternatives to um, ensure that they didn't have to be built, right? And that oftentimes there's transparency issues when speakers are being built that the community doesn't know about it until much later on, um, and that they have a much higher disproportionate um, I know the Peabody plant in Massachusetts, for instance, the Peabody community is paying a huge price tag for that power plant without really having been educated onto it as all. Well. So a lot of um, peaker power plant development is intentional and in where it's located and um, and who knows about it. And if it was if it was not that way and it was a transparent process and these were located in communities, um, regardless of your socioeconomic status, I think we'd be seeing innovation a lot quicker. Yeah, thank you. That. Um... We don't have a lot of time left here. Uh, a question came in from somebody who had clearly read the report, so thank you for that, uh, about the, the American Lung Association numbers for health impacts and, and mortality. How, um, the fact that those combine uh, multiple combustion sources, transmission, and power plants, um, which in the, the, the peaker opposition effort is, is not entirely useful because they, they want to be able to untangle that. So, Shelly, can you speak to, to maybe other tools that people could, could use to, to be able to isolate more that what is the impact of, of these, these speaker plants? Yeah, and we've got the, the tools in the back of the report. And um, the, uh, the EPA has, uh, I have to pull it up now. There's so many of them. Um, all right, Seth, you might know it off the top of your head better. 
but I can yeah, I can probably jump in. I, I think the the Cobra tool. Yeah. Is probably. Yeah, Cobra and Avert. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, those are in the back um, of and, and links to well, yeah, links to those are in the in the back of the report. Um, COBRA uh, stands for the Co-Benefits Risk Assessment Health Impacts Screening and Mapping Tool. Um, and then AVERT is Avoided Emissions and Generation Tool. And those two can be used together to um, kind of zone in. in the, they both have a web-enabled um, version, but then a much more functional um, uh, and nimble downloaded version where you can uh, see data and emissions data um, and um, basically the the health impacts and the dollar impacts at a, a much more minute level Aaron might be able to help me with this I see yeah actually Elias seed would you um, mind me talking about some of the public data tools that we used for this and, and help folks understand sort of what kinds of information they can find there yeah, I think that I touched on a couple of them. Um, the one that I probably want to highlight again is the um, power plants and neighboring communities mapping tool by the EPA. I think you know if if you don't want to download data sets and use GIS to map them, uh, I think that gives you a snapshot at least um, of some of the most important facts to know about you know each power plant that is located. Those two communities, it basically combines um, power plant data, emissions data, and data from the environmental justice screen, which already considers uh, demographic, environmental, and social uh, facts to create um, indices, indexes of uh, vulnerability. So, combining that, you can, you know, if you are looking at this from your own community, you can like zoom in, uh, look at the power plants around your community and look at their impacts. So I think that that's, that's the one that I like. All right, a couple, couple of plugs that uh, we've taken all the peaker data from that EPA mapping tool and put it in a, a peaker mapping tool that if you go to our phase out peakers uh, initiative web page on cleanegroup.org, then you can see that all broken down and there are maps showing the impact of peakers on, on low income communities and, and communities of color there. Uh, also, uh, a plug for, we did a webinar with EPA on Avert and COBRA earlier this year, so you can find that in, in our webinars. Um, so, I think we're about out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to uh, close things off now and thank all of our presenters. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending today. Please reach out to us with any other questions you have, and I want to turn it over to Samantha to tell you about a couple of additional webinars that we have coming up. Thanks, Seth, and thank you so much to all of our speakers and to everyone who attended today. Um, so on your screen, you should see some information about a handful of upcoming webinars that we have. I won't read all of these out loud, but you can see the titles on your screen and you can read more about them on our website at cleanegroup.org slash webinars. It's a good lineup. I hope you can attend some of these. And um, if so, we'll see you then. Thank you all again. Bye-bye.